Out with the old and in with the new has been the motto of many over the years. It can be nice to replace an old chair for a new one or get a new car because the old one still stinks from the dead b that old fishing trip that you took last year. And when it comes to computers, I'm certainly as much to blame. Always wanting a faster and more powerful one so that I can get online and play World of Warcraft with my buddies or stream my poor my YouTube videos a little faster. You often hear people say that older stuff was made to last. My old Chevy Bel Air 64 that my dad had given me at the age of 16 was built like a tank, which was a good thing since whenever I used to hit the side of the garage trying to park it, the car barely had a scratch on it. But I digress. Much of the old electronic equipment was built in the same way. It generally weighed a ton, and many of those old amplifiers are still running today and worth being restored. When it came to computers, they got faster and had more RAM, but they were certainly not built equally, which, in all honesty, was sometimes a good thing. In other cases, it was too complicated to change the hardware. Did you know, for example, that until 2016 the Grand Rapids Public School District in Michigan still had its heat and air conditioning for 19 schools controlled by an Amiga 2000 computer with a 1200 baud modem? And you might have heard of the famous Commodore 64 that's still running in an auto shop in Danks, Poland for balancing drive shafts. Well, it looks like it's true. And believe me, in 30 years of working in different IT departments for large and small companies, I can vouch for my share of these stories. Should be told that the bigger the company with the deepest pockets were most often the worst. Server rooms with a 20-year-old computer sitting in a corner with a sign that said, do not turn off, because no one quite knew if it would ever turn on again or exactly how it worked, and it was always on someone's to-do list that would get passed on to a new employee when the old one left. In 2015, Yahoo News wrote an article stating that the White House administration was still being run on floppy disks, and so was the Federal Register, and that some agencies of the US government still scan documents and save them to floppies. But why are we still using all this equipment? Is it that much better? Sure, they were bulky and heavy, but was that it? Why is an old amplifier like a 1978 Pioneer SX 1980 that sold for $1,200 is sought after and sells for over $12,000 US today? The answer is simple. It was a labor of love that went into making these components and we made them in hope of them lasting forever. Like many things, sometimes an upgrade or maintenance is needed and is ignored by people who have the if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude. And over the years, others fell through the cracks as they say. But some equipment has been either a challenge or downright impossible to replace because it's running software that has been written by a guy in his garage over 40 years ago and there's nothing or no one out there willing to adapt it to the new hardware. In all fairness, however, as much as we like the latest and greatest, the software doesn't always keep up with the capabilities of the new hardware either. This is why some games developed today for the old Commodores are quite amazing because the programmers push the limits of the hardware. Then there are things like the Voyager probes sent to space that are still running since 1977. NASA managed to send a software update to it but are continually looking for programmers who work in Fortran and are not 80 but closer to 50 years old. The saddest has been to see certain trades disappear. Just like the good old shoemaker that my mom used to make me bring her heels to re-glue for the fifth time, the local TV and radio repairman where we brought our black and white TV on a regular basis because we used to have to hit it on top to get the image back is a thing of the past. And there are many more trades and programmers that have been left in the dust. You can see just how important some of this old technology is and how it's still in use today and continues to outperform some of the newer, while some are sitting in a home or commercial museum but in need of some restoration. Adding to this, the uprise in nostalgia for all these retro and vintage items in the past years have rendered the knowledge of fixing and programming them invaluable. You would be amazed how many people write to me and ask me if I can fix their stuff because they can't find anyone to do it or who knows how to do it properly. And while you might think that all your hardware knowledge of this old stuff or basic commands that you learned when you were a kid is a thing of the past, you might want to reconsider. I think more than ever our technology is at a turning point and many might want the latest and greatest, but the caveat is that it's just our old tech that's been boosted, compacted, and automated. But without a good understanding of the old, you'll never be able to achieve the great innovations from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So if you're about a half century old like me and going through a midlife crisis and looking for the new career or younger girlfriend, save the money from the divorce and the Porsche and harness your energy on going back to your roots or brush up on those old computer or electronic skills you learned so many years ago. Who knows, you might be the next young hire at NASA, reopen that local TV repair shop or end up saving the world from an old programming glitch from a 50 year old probe deep in space that's run into alien technology. 
and worst case scenario, you can end up on YouTube desperately trying to get people to watch your videos and convincing them to join your little cult. Thanks for watching.